Alexander the Great. Let's talk about why he was so great. And, you know, I read this book recently called Alexander in the East, and it really gives you an inside look into who Alexander was as a person. See, guys, when you're reading about these people who lived a long time ago, it's really hard to, um, you know, get good information on them. So this was recommended by someone who is an, you know, histor great historian, uh, incredible history buff. Uh, his name's Dan Carlin. If you haven't already, watch his show, his podcast called Hardcore History. You'll learn so much about history, different periods in history. Like recently, I was learning about the atomic bomb and, you know, how President Truman had to make that decision. Um, and, you know, Oppenheimer and all these guys that played a role into, you know, the making of the atomic bomb. But anyways, Alexander in the East was recommended by Dan Carlin. Um, I want to get right into this one, guys. Um, incredible read. All right, let's start with chapter one, which is called The Shield of Achilles. So um, here it says that Alexander had an intense intellectual curiosity, and that remained unstifled by his military calling, right? He felt called to a, a military career, and he wanted to become the best. And to become the best, you have to be incredibly diligent in learning about every other battle that came before you, right? Just like Napoleon Bonaparte studied Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great studied the people that came before him. So that's uh, the, the number one thing. If you're, if you're not curious, if you're not fascinated by, by what you want to do, then you're not going to be the best because there is a guy out there who is more curious than you, who wants to do better than you, right? Who's working harder than you because he feels called to do it right? Next, by using force, he united mankind. Alexander was simultaneously a conqueror, a civilizer, and a benefactor of mankind. Here it says that for Alexander, the ultimate winner was rational, vision, visionary, and humanitarian, right? Rational, visionary, humanitarian. Here, Alexander says, warn your competitors of the consequences of revolt. He never backed away from a challenge his entire career. He was incredibly brutal in his punishments. Casual vi violence was the norm for Alexander or around Alexander. Guys, I don't think we understand like nowadays... Right, we see an act of violence and we're like, "Oh my God, that's you know terrible." Uh, but we have evolved so much as as a species, guys. Like a couple thousand years ago, in Alexander's time, it was brutal, man. People were getting their heads chopped off. They were ripping the scalps off of people they killed. Right, like they they were or, or, or doing it while they were alive. Like terrible stuff, beheadings, all that stuff. Up to a couple hundred years ago, that was the norm in the Western world. I just read George Washington's uh, biography, and it was talking about how they were beheading, uh, you know, beheadings and stuff. And you know, if if someone did something wrong, right, broke the law, whatever it was. I remember this one story in the book. They put someone's head on a church, right, and that was something that people were just like, oh, like that was a, that wasn't crazy. Isn't that insane? And nowadays, you know, we're so soft, I feel like, and we, you know, violence is not a good thing, but we need to understand that we've come a long way, uh, especially in the Western world, right? Some parts of the world, yes, still brutal today. Um, and that's something to keep in mind as well, to be grateful for where you are and understand that, you know, these really, you know, uh, occasional acts of violence that occur in our society um, you know, at least it's better than what we came from. And we're never going to be able to eliminate violence entirely, unfortunately. Um, you're just being naive, if you think so. Um, expertise and reputation deterred adversaries from risking battle. Expertise and reputation deterred adversaries from risking battle. So for Alexander, because he had such great expertise, because his reputation was you know, impeccable, right? He had the best reputation out of any great leader in his time. Um, 
his adversaries were afraid to go to battle with him. And this could be applied to any area of life, guys. Like if we're, if we're building a business, if you have incredible expertise, you have a great reputation, right? It's going to deter anyone from wanting to compete with you. And in turn, your business grows bigger, right? And no one will risk battle with you because they know that you'll win because you've shown that you'll win through past battles. Alexander behaved as if he felt no binding moral constraints. All right, chapter two, windows on the truth. The king is in the best position to verify what he records, right? Other people recording history for you is not a real remark of history, right? It's the king, right? It's the person doing the thing, right? That is in the best position to verify what he's done. And sometimes, look, that's going to have some bias in it, right? If, if I'm recording my life's history, I'm going to leave out certain parts. And if someone is writing a biography on me, they're going to include certain parts, right? So it, it's, it's a thing where, you know, I, I, it, it's a give and take, right? I think, I think there's, um, there's positives and negatives of both, right? Other people recording his, your own history and then you recording your own history, right? Um, in both situations, um, there's conflict of interest. So, um, the attack was a bluff to test the resolution of the enemy. He attacked the enemy from three sides, right? So the more angles that you can attack the enemy from the better suffering is the price of glory. And this, this use of the word glory, I see it so much. Um, just like Napoleon said, a life without glory is a life not lived at all. Um, right. These guys wanted to live a glorious life. They didn't just want to, you know, accumulate power. They wanted to go down in history. His troops only hope of return was for Alexander to return with them. <clears throat> the capture of an obscure village was not worth the danger to the king's life. Right. I think, wow, I just thought about this. Like, you know, as we're, as we're gaining more power, right. In any area, right. If you're, if you're a political leader, if you're a uh, owner of a massive corporation, um, all of a sudden you want to start devouring everything, right. You want to become a conglomerate, right. If you're, if you're the leader of a nation, you want to start taking over other countries, right. If you're the leader of a company, you want to start taking over other companies, but the capture of an obscure village replaced village with obscure company, obscure country is not worth the danger to the king's life. So I kind of take from that, don't get greedy. That was the main lesson I took away from that. To risk one's life when defeat was not irretrievable was... One more time. To risk one's life when defeat was not irretrievable was dereliction of duty. Mm, that's good. Wow. A short and glorious life rather than a long but obscure existence. Again, glorious, glory. That word is used so much with these guys. Um, there's no single window to the truth. All right, chapter three, information and misinformation. And I guess that line I said before kind of plays into that too. He deliberately took the most difficult route. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Alexander was someone who I guess was, you know, just wanted to challenge himself. And he's like, you know what? Let's just take the most difficult route just to see that we can do this. Right. Local informants helped him get a full description of the landscape. Right. So he deployed local informants to help him understand the terrain that he was about to enter. Right. Think about this in other areas of life. If you want to understand the industry you're entering, the country you're entering, the city you're entering, whatever it is, you want to get some local informants, right? Replace that word local informants with, you know, insiders in a business to give you the full description of the landscape slash business slash country, right? You want to deploy those informants. The price was military action 
to promote his interests. No one may practice any profession unless schooled in it from childhood. And that was something that uh, Alexander took away from Plato. Uh, Plato says that, you know, to be exceptional at something, you must start from, you know, when you're really young and then build up that skill set over time. And all of a sudden you're an expert and that you're at the top. Right. Um, all right. Chapter four, the creation of belief. All right. This, this is where you really get a look inside the mind of Alexander, right? There was a comparison between Alexander and the divine. Alexander's credentials as a God amongst the men far outweighed theirs. And then in the, in this chapter, it talks about a story of this guy named, um, I think it's Cletus. Cletus denied his superhuman status. So he was killed, right? So Alexander was really put on this pedestal. He was becoming a godly figure. And when you deny the existence of a godly figure, especially back then, boom, they'll kill you. Um, so that's what happened to him. Um, Alexander reacted violently to candid criticism from his intimates. All right, so Alexander started to be unable to take criticism from people. Um, and I think this is something that happens when you accumulate a lot of power. You think you're right all the time. It's a dangerous position to be in. Um, he believed it more practical, practical to be ruled by the best men than by the best laws or best man, single singular man. And that man was Alexander. Judge when to override the generality of the laws and the courage to act without fear or favor. Mm. All right, guys. Alexander occupied... Listen to this. He occupied the position on earth, which Zeus held at Olympus. Really becoming a godly figure here, right? Um, they were expected to reinforce norms of law by his own behavior. Or he was expected to reinforce norms of law by his own behavior. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like lead by example, right? Show people your behavior, and that's how people will act in turn. Alexander could redefine morality and legislate as he pleased. Victory, no matter how brilliant and crushing, did not elevate a man beyond his mortality. So that's kind of keeping us in check, guys. Understanding that no matter how victorious we are, you could conquer the whole planet. Right? That does not elevate you above mortality, beyond mortality. We will all die one day, right? And no matter how powerful you get, you think you're the king of the world. You think you're invincible. You're not. Because something can happen to you like that. Especially if you get greedy. Now that Alexander had joined the gods, they worshipped him, worshipped him as a god. It was a lesson not to resist innovations dear to Alexander's heart. He was always proving himself the equal or superior of the gods. Older legends inspire Alexander to prove himself superior to them. Wow. One more time. Older legends inspired Alexander to prove himself superior to them. And I've, I, I got to be honest, that I feel the same way when I read about these people who've done incredible things. I don't think about, oh, how can I replicate what they did? No, no, no. That's not the mentality. That's not the mentality. The mentality is how can I be better than them? That's the mentality. Even the greats, how can I be better than the best? Right? Not how can I, you know, get to become like the best. How can I be better than the best? 
His divinity was univer universally and openly recognized. So that just gave you a look in, inside how, how Alexander really became a godly figure. Chapter 5, the justification of terror. Right? This is, this is an intense chapter. Um, in Alexander's interest to attack... Oh, it was in Alexander's interest to attack while two peoples were at odds. He waited for two of his enemies to get into conflict with one another, one another, one, one another, and then attacked, right? So wait until your enemies start fighting each other, and then bang, you can attack. And then there was a story in this chapter about the Mali people, or the Mali people, um, and it was talking about how they were def defenseless, and um, Alexander essentially just conquered them through sheer terror, brutality, killings. Um, it was a total massacre. The only escape for, from death or enslavement was unconditional surrender. He demanded instant, unconditional surrender. They chose him as their master, and he respected their autonomy. Right? So he's like, I'll let you be free, but you need to know that I'm your master and you will obey what I say. So it's not really freedom, right? But he's like, I'll let you live as long as you accept me as your master. Non-compliance was sufficient justification for war, right? So you don't agree with me? Boom, war, war, I'm going to destroy you. Rebels could expect the most extreme treatment, right? If you rebelled against Alexander, expect that, um, you know, you'll probably be killed. That's what extreme treatment means. Tortured, killed, whatever it is. Um, he regarded the conquest of India as his right, right? Not that he just wanted to conquer India. It was his right to conquer India, Right? And I think that mentality is good, not in, not in, in a situation like this, but in life, you know, you have to believe it's your right to be successful. It's your right to be at the top, especially if you're working your ass off every day to earn it. The victims have become the culprits. Chapter 6, Alexander in the Desert. And this is the very end of the book, guys. Not too much from this, but just want to give you some, some last couple lines here. He saw conquest as his destiny from the outs, outset of his career. It was his destiny to conquer. Right? And he knew that from day one. And he had supreme confidence from day one till the end of his life. And um, there was no doubt in Alexander's belief in his invincibility. So guys, go ahead, read that book, Alexander in the East. Again, um, you know, if, if you don't care about my recommendation, Dan Carlin recommended it. And um, he's read so much about history. And he, uh, he says it's a great starting point to learn about Alexander. And uh, what I'm realizing is, you know, reading these guys more and more, you feel yourself, you feel your mind changing, right? I think, I think we're all indoctrinated to some sense. And I think I said this in a recent video, we're all indoctrinated in some sense. I don't care what you think, right? You're like, no, I'm a free thinker, right? But I, I know I'm indoctrinated. And, um, you know, John Rockefeller talked about this. He's like, you must indoctrinate yourself to become successful. You must become a disciple of the gospel of success. And if you're only flooding your mind, right? Flooding your mind with the works of great people, with the ideas of great people, aren't you in, in a sense indoctrinating yourself into becoming successful? How do you think these guys get there? How do you think they get there? It's total indoctrination. So don't let any other person's opinion, right? 
someone who hasn't done anything great in their life infiltrate your mind. Because if you feel like it's destiny, then it is destiny. And you'll get there. Right? It's just a matter of time. But if you allow other people's opinions, other people's judgments about what you should do in your life affect the daily actions that you take, you will live a sad and uh, unglorious life, if that's a word. And a life not filled with glory is a life not lived at all, according to Napoleon. And uh, I agree with that, in a sense. So look, guys, I hope you enjoyed. Um, let me know how you liked it in the comments. Uh, go ahead, get the book, Alexander and the East. And uh, yeah, guys, talk to you soon. Um, yeah, keep going, keep going. Never quit. This is our time, right? Um, if you're young, if you're hungry, um, you can do this. Right now, it's 6.30 in the morning on a Sunday. I've already worked out. And uh, I recorded this video for you guys, and I'm ready to go and crush the day. And it's St. Patrick's Day today. Most people got home at four in the morning, whereas I woke up at four in the morning. Most people are going to waste this Sunday recovering from how drunk they were, right? This is what it takes. This is what it takes, guys. Um... So if people ever ask me one day, ever ask you one day, you know, how did you become successful? Tell them, hey, look at all this proof I have. That's what I'm gonna do. People ask me, hey, look, look at all, look at, uh, you know, I've been waking up at 4 a.m. for uh, years, years, every day, Monday through Sunday. Um. Right? Document that. Document that, guys. It's great. You'll be able to look back at your life and uh, say, man, look at all this shit I've done. Anyways, talk to you guys soon. See you in the next video. Bye.